It will be Dr. Allison Justice, uh, Vice President of Cultivation at Outco. Dr. Justice graduated from Clemson University with a PhD in Plant and Environmental Science. During her time at Clemson, Justice taught greenhouse management to undergrad students where they focused on organic methods and production. Her dissertation involved investigating the effects of beneficial mycorrhizal organisms. Uh, oof, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pronounce this. I'll try my best. Pyro, Pyroformospora indica, where she learned that organic sustainable growing can be easy, cost effective, and produce aesthetically pleasing plants when done properly. Post-graduation, Dr. Justice developed a system, patent pending, to mass rear beneficial nematodes for commercial use that led her to consulting on integrated pest management nationwide. Dr. Justice has extensive experience in greenhouse production, having helped open and operate her family's greenhouse business, where they've been growing sustainably for over five years. As a recent transplant from the ornamental sector of horticulture, she understands the importance of growing a high-quality plant organically and at a low cost. Through research, Dr. Justice is elevating the standards of cannabis cultivation, both indoors and in greenhouse settings. Allison, take it away. Thank you very much. It's piriforma spora indica. <laughs> I definitely had to practice that one uh, a good bit. Um, thank you for having me today. Um, this talk will mainly be on uh, post-harvest. So, you know, after the plants come out of the greenhouses and grows and outdoor, you know, what do, what do we do with those plants? Um, I just want to give a shout out to Dr. Marcus Rogan, my counterpart at ELCO. Um, he did a lot of this research uh, with me. We did it collaboratively. Um, and so a lot of this research was his. Um, and so coming into this industry, you know, I ask what is the dry and what is the cure and why do we do it? Um, and the normal answer is to remove moisture, you know, of course, to make it smell better, um, but why and, and how? Um, you know, drying is to prevent spoilage, so to prevent microbial growth and curing, you know, maybe it's homogenization, whether that's just making all of the buds smell better, um, you know, making them homogenize as far as water content, you know, we don't know. I personally have never seen data to support any of this, but, you know, what we do know is that people are doing it right in the industry. You know, people produce high quality, um, very nice smelling products, so it's happening, but, you know, we need to dig a little deeper and we need to, we need to know why and how. Um, you know, some of the things I've heard uh, throughout my time in the cannabis industry is, you know, maybe it's the removal of chlorophyll or the conversion of starches to sugars, uh, you know, some sort of exchanging of gases, homogenization. Um, and so a lot of my research going forward is going to be in the post-harvest processes. Um, you know, once we figure out the why, we can optimize and we can, you know, do the speed up what we figure out to be that why. Um, so just um, a few important terms to take away and to keep in mind when I'm going through this talk is one being transpiration, so the process by which plants and plant parts lose moisture through the transport of water through the skin, evaporation of this water from the plant surface, and convective mass transport of water to the surroundings. So keep in mind um, what Dr. Nardi was talking about with DPD. Um, you know, we experience the same sort of thing in the drying process, except there's no roots. So if we have high transpiration with no roots to bring in moisture, plant's going to dry out very fast. Uh, next, respiration. So this is the chemical and enzymatic process by which fruits and vegetables convert sugars and oxygen into CO2, water, and heat. So think about it almost as the reverse process of photosynthesis. All right. And so, you know, coming from the ornamental industry, there is probably thousands of peer-reviewed articles and, you know, hundreds of years of data going into fruit and vegetable post-harvest production, uh, cut flowers, cuttings. So, you know, uh, many, many research dollars spent of, you know, you have poinsettia cuttings being produced in Latin America and they're shipped over to the U.S. to be stuck. Well, all of that right there is science. All of that is optimization studies that can happen 
to figure out how to, um, you know, not have rotting during shipment. Um, you know, we found you reduce ethylene and it reduces that speed of senescence. Um, so there's just so much out there in other industries that we need to pull together um, to figure out what's going on with our drying and cured methods and, and let's optimize. And so through all this research, you know, what the goal is, is to delay the, the death, to preserve, um, to delay ripening um, for the consumer and to propagate, maybe to decorate with cut flowers. Um, but how are we doing this? And there's, like I said, there's thousands and thousands of peer reviewed articles showing, you know, even down to the species level, how certain plants um, hold up in post harvest. But in general, what we're looking at is slowing down respiration and transpiration. You know, we're putting these plants and these plant organs into a stasis for a certain purpose. Um, you know, the general method is to provide cool temperatures, basically to slow down um, metabolism, respiration. Um, removing ethylene is a, a huge, a huge process for vegetables and fruits and, and cuttings and cut flowers. Um, so figuring out, you know, how much ethylene are these plants being produced and do we need to apply something to remove that ethylene? And then high humidity where the plants don't dry out. So with cannabis, um, drying, you know, what's, what's our main goal here? Um, you know, first off, it's to prevent immediate spoilage. So prohibit the microbial growth, pro prohibit the microbe germination, which in turn will extend the shelf life. Um, you know, but at the same time, we want to dry it slow enough not to volatilize our terpenes. And then, you know, at the end, what we have to do is provide a product that is a nice smoke um, that burns well for that end consumer. Um, in general, dry rooms are kept at 60 to 74 degrees Fahrenheit and about 40 to 60 percent uh, relative humidity. And so, you know, what factors influence microbial growth? That's water activity, temperature, and pH. Uh, pH is difficult. Uh, you can't really control it. It's it's a natural change in the plant once it's harvested. Temperature, if we have um, the correct facility, that can be easy to control. And then water activity. Um, this is the one that we can measure and that we should be uh, keeping an eye on for multiple reasons. Um, and so, you know, more microorganisms have a limiting water activity level below which they cannot grow. And so water activity, or AW, is not moisture content and it determines the lower limit of available water for these microbes to grow. Um, so bacteria, yeast, molds, they all require a certain amount of this available water to support growth. Um, and so that makes it very important for us to harvest at certain water activities um, in order to not give a conducive envir environment to these microbes. And so this is just a table looking at um, water activity with different microorganisms in food products. So obviously fresh meat, um, fruit, vegetable, at a high water activity, they discourage mold and yeast growth, but bacteria can still flourish. Um, going at the opposite spectrum, caramels, crackers, uh, powdered milk, you know, they have to have this lower water activity um, in order to reduce the growth of these microorganisms. And so, you know, where does cannabis fall in, in this? Um, we don't know. I can, I, I plan to give you examples of, you know, other crops that are similar, but, uh, you know, I think we're still going down that, that path of, of journey to figure out where cannabis lies. Right, so this is a graph I actually put together to, give you an idea of at least, you know, how an outcome we're looking at the drying process. So the y-axis showing water activity, zero to one, with one being basically the water activity of a live plant with roots, and then zero being bone dry. Um, we're looking at days one to 14. And so what we're trying to do here is balance um, the inhibition of microbe growth, but not encourage terpene loss. So 
you know, E. coli, salmonella, these are microbes that, you know, if you're not applying manure on the foliage, you shouldn't have them as a problem post-harvest. Whereas botrytis is pretty ubiquitous, um, it's everywhere, and it's much harder to control. So, you know, our goal is within those first couple of days, drop that water activity down far enough to where botrytis cannot continue to grow while at the same time keeping it high enough and not removing uh, too much water to where those terpenes are uh, evaporated off. And so looking through the research, um, you can be pretty confident that um, a water activity of about 0.8 represents the value in which uh, botrytis cannot grow. Um, and then the graph to the right here shows that, um, and this is not a slow dry, this is a, a fast dry versus a slow dry, but it shows that you can evaporate off a lot of those terpenes. And, you know, we all know that terpenes very much equals quality. And so this is another graph kind of representing the same thing. Um, this graph kind of represents the research path I want to go down um, here in the near future. And so the x-axis, you'll see zero to one being water activity. Um, you see where bacterial growth, yeast growth, and mold growth stop basically at 0.7 water activity. Um, this next range, the, tri or the um, rectangle represents where certain enzymatic activity is occurring. So, you know, the plant is not completely dead yet at this high of water activity. You know, there's still enzymatic properties happening where, you know, maybe sugar is being converted, I'm, I'm sorry, starch is being converted to sugar or maybe there's a certain water activity um, threshold where chlorophyll can be broken down. And so this is that range where we want that long um, dry to happen where those certain enzyme enzymatic activities can continue to happen to give that prime product. And then the other thing that to consider is, well, what is that water activity in which the consumer wants, you know, as far as fill and as far as, well, is this too sticky and it feels wet even though it doesn't grow microbes, it might just be too wet for that end user. So these are all things that, you know, we have to look at and consider um, when trying to optimize. Okay, and so this is a paper um, called the Effects of Water Activity, um, basically from isolated botrytis from grapes. And so the graph on the left shows fungal radius growth at different water activities with botrytis. And so basically what we're seeing here is that at a water activity of 0.92, botrytis radial growth, so mycelial growth, is prohibited. Um, and then on the right, you see it's the same, it's the same idea, but it's looking at actual germination. And so once you get under that 0.93 water activity, um, germination cannot occur. And so the reason I said 0.8 earlier is because, you know, these studies and, and the data we're able to get are in pure culture. So all of these studies were done on a petri dish, basically. So we know that the cannabis bud is much more complex than uh, just a petri dish, but it's at least somewhere to start. All right, and so curing, you know, this is that second step. And what is curing? You know, uh, many people in the industry do it in many different ways. They'll do it in boxes, bags, buckets, plastic, um, and many times will produce a very different product. Um, usually it's in an ambient condition, so, you know, just a room where potentially you're, you're trimming or uh, packaging products, 70 degrees, 40 to 50 percent humidity. and it's, you know, depending on the company or the person, it can be from a week up to three months. And so, you know, again, I like to look over to other industries and see what they're doing and, you know, kind of get a starting point um, for cannabis. And so if we look at tobacco, they cure as well. Um, and why do they do it? Just like us, it's, it's for flavor and for smokeability. Um, through research, they found it is, it actually is to remove the chlorophyll. Um, you know, they find that balance from keeping the plant alive to then become yellow and then dying. 
where this is where they actually cut off that um, ability to go through those enzymatic changes. Um, and that's where you see here on the, the final bullet that the leaves are killed to stop those changes because they're able to optimize to make the leaf how you know, they desire. Um, and then just a quick graph showing um, chlorophyll over time is greatly reduced through um, their processes. And if you would like to read further into any of these papers um, on the bottom right, you can look those up on the internet. And so curing a tobacco, there's lots of ways to do it depending on what your end goal is. So a flu cure, it's a short one week, basically a, a barn um, dry slash cure. Um, it produces high sugar and nicotine. The air cure is a bit longer and it's low in sugar, high in nicotine, and it's meant for cigars. Fire cure, three days to 10 weeks, low sugar, high nicotine, and that produces um, pipe and chewing products. And then there's the sun cure, basically for the oriental uh, tobacco, high sugar and low in nicotine. And so I imagine one day, you know, we'll, we'll figure out different ways to cure cannabis. And with the idea in mind that you're producing it for, you know, a potentially a different method, you know, or are we, are we growing cannabis for pre-rolls or are we growing it for, um, you know, premium bud. There's there's potential to go many ways with this, but you know, when you look over to other industries, it's it's nice and it gives you great starting ideas. But at the same time, we are different. You know, with tobacco, they're not worried about all oh, their terpenes evaporating off. So, um, like I said, we 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 take the ideas, but um, we can't copy it exactly. And so, digging a little further into the science. Um, you know, what is the chemistry of curing tobacco? It's basically dominated by hydraulic, um, hydrolytic enzymes, so starts to sugar, which what we've heard is happening in the cannabis industry. Um, and they found that de degrading the carotenoids uh, have a negative influence on the flavor. And so, you know, that is something we should look at as well. Um, and the success depends on their leaf maturity, temperature and humidity, and the water content of the leaf. Looking at another agricultural industry, um, the aging of wine. Um, so wine is made by fermenting grape, sugar to ethanol. Um, the aroma comes from these chemical changes that are happening during the winemaking and the wine storage, just, just as our product does. Um, you know, there's nearly 9,000 components that or molecules that are within wine. Um, and just like cannabinoids, you know, we know what a couple hundred, but there's potentially thousands out there. And what's really interesting is that in wine, you know, you can have components that are parts per trillion, and that's what's actually giving, you know, certain craft top wines their their individual type flavor. And there's <laughs> I don't think we're even testing it for parts per trillion. So it, it'll be really interesting where we evolve to. All right, and so our first project, um, what I like to call the BERT project, was looking at the cure and saying, all right, well, let's just let's see what's happening in those buckets. So we took a five-gallon bucket um, that you can see has a, a fill gasket. We put sensors inside that measured CO2, humidity, temperature, and then we did a water activity at the beginning and at the end of this process. The treatments were a control, so the bucket was not opened for two weeks. We did an outco burp, which um, was designated as the first three days of the cure, um, the lid to be removed 15 to 20 minutes, and then fluffed. Um, and then the industry burp, the lid was opened for an hour a day for two weeks, and again, fluffed. And so what we found was pretty interesting. Um, if I can just explain the graph, um, the top's Mendo, the bottom's Tangible. Um, the red line going horizontal is ambient CO2, and then the blue line is the industry burp, orange line is the outco burp, and the green line is no burp. 
And so what we concluded from this, just looking at CO2, is that CO2 builds up greatly over time. Um, a burp releases the CO2 and it instantly encourages that buildup back of CO2. Um, the industry burp, although longer, it did immediately and most drastically increase CO2. And then, you know, what are we doing here? Are we allowing more O2 for respiration? Um, you know, the <laughs> gathering data is great, but we've, we've definitely got to do more research to, to answer the whys. And then if we zoom in a little bit on this experiment, probably the most interesting thing we found is that these buckets, even though they, they do fill, they're not gas tight. They definitely follow the trend of their environment. So if you look at the red lines where there was a burp, so that represents 7 a.m., um, no matter which treatment, there's a spike of CO2 being measured between burps and then it actually goes down. Well, when you look at the timestamp, um, these peaks represent the end of the workday. <laughs> and so these buckets were kept in the production room where there could be anywhere from five to 20 employees. Um, you know, the CO2 rises in the room, it's also rising in the bucket, and about four o'clock when everybody leaves, we see that that peak decreases. So this taught us something very interesting about our buckets and, you know, with the next experiments, we've got to use buckets that are gas tight. All right, and so looking at relative humidity, um, I basically combined all treatments here because they did follow the same trend, um, which is the red line. And if you look at the green line, that's the ambient humidity. So I had a sensor sitting outside of the buckets. Um, and so, again, very interesting to find because one of the things I've been told for quite a while is that, you know, the burp is a release of moisture. Well, you know, that's great if you want to decrease your moisture, but what we're actually finding happened is that it's not a release of moisture. So the burp follows the trend of whatever's in the room. So if you look at the first burp, um, you see a decrease from the bucket sensor and then it's going down, but that's because the humidity in the room is lower. Whereas at the second burp, you burp, the humidity spikes because the humidity in the room is up. But in general, um, the humidity reading within the bucket stays pretty consistent throughout you know, that, that two week time period. Okay, and so this graph represents um, starting and ending water activity. And so if you look at the right of the graph, it says start and end, and then we have our three different treatments. Um, what was incredibly interesting here is that the variance, and I'm sorry, let me explain, um, each data point represents three measurements with um, the error bars being the variance. So how far that data point varied from the mean sample. Um, and so what was interesting is that the starting variance is much higher than the ending variance. Um, so the samples within that bucket are becoming more homogenous. But even more so interesting is that the samples are actually becoming wetter. Um, so just for example, the outco burp, you know, it's a median of about 0.5, and then at the end, it's at 0.56, and that's, that's a huge difference. And so what I'm thinking is happening here is that, you know, specifically with the large buds, that surface water is, the, the surface is much drier than what's on the inside of that bud, because water activity doesn't measure what's inside, it's just measuring the surface. So, I think what's happening is just that homogenization. So that internal moisture is coming outside. And so all of these buds are becoming, um, you know, basically that same moisture, that same water content as each other. And so we saw the same sort of trend with tangible, um, you know, definitely lower variance and then also um, wetter plant materials. Okay, and then looking at temperature, again, it is highly directly uh, correlated with, with what's happening in the room. So 
is uh, the crew comes in and, you know, the, the HVAC can't handle uh, all the hot bodies, then temperature spikes, the temperature in the bucket spikes as well. All right, so our takeaways, plastic buckets are not gas tight. Um, with our burp treatments tested, the RH in the bucket stays consistent throughout the cure. Um, water activity increases over time, and temperature follows the room trend. Okay, and so what is cannabis to a chemist? You know, it's lots of molecules, many, many, many molecules. Alkaloids, lactones, terpenes, cannabinoids, um, all things that we can measure and, and should begin start measuring, especially in post-harvest. So does anything happen to THC and CBD? And these are experiments done by Dr. Rogan. So I'll try to explain them as best as possible. Um, but what he did was look at a 30-day cure and test samples to see how CBD and THC changes over time. And basically what he found with the THC and CBD is there's virtually no statistical relevant changes, at least within a 30-day time. I'm sure if you went for months, there could be some sort of change, but um, at least within this time span, there was not. All right, so this part is looking at THC and THC acid, so basically the decarboxylation throughout the cure. And he did find that there was decarboxylation um, within a 30-day time period. All right, and so terpenes. Um, he found that there was not terpene change as far as total terpenes. But what we did find is that individual terpenes would change, so potentially different ratios of terpenes, but at the same concentration. Um, and a lot of this has to do with being um, primary or uh, secondary terpenes. So future research, um, you know, this just barely, barely scraped the surface of, of where post-harvest research needs to go. Um, you know, we've got a spectrophotometer, or a spectrophotometer, excuse me, a spectrophotometer, that's the hard word to say. Um, and so then we'll be able to look at sugars and chlorophylls and, and carotenoids, flavonoids, and see, you know, throughout the cure how these change and throughout you know, if we raise the temperature, how do these change? If we, um, you know, change the humidity, how, how does everything change? And once we know, again, we can optimize that. Could we turn a, a two-week dry and cure time period into a couple of days if, if we know how to affect this plant? Maybe. Um, pH changes, we should look and see, you know, what's happening with this plant internally as far as pH goes um, throughout the cure. Is there any sort of fermentation taking place like it does in tobacco? Um, you know, what do these humidity manipulation packs do? Um, does, it, does it make sense to put one pack in, uh, you know, a gram jar? Uh, does it make sense financially? I'm not sure. Um, you know, and then is there any idea of adding different things to the cure to provide a better taste, you know, uh, doing it in oak wood barrels? Um, I'm not sure, but I would love to, to give it a try. And then going even back into the grow room, you know, there are things that you can do to basically to make the post-harvest quality better. So, for example, flushing. This is one that's been talked about for so long with very little research up until recently um, to prove it otherwise. Um, in theory, it, it makes sense, but... In reality, what they found at the University of Guelph is at least looking at elemental factors, the flush, whether it's one week or two week, has no significant difference between um, it, removing elemental um, parts. Um, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that flushing does not encourage some sort of uh, some sort of senescence or some sort of, you know, dying kicking in basically to then speed up some of those enzymatic processes that would make it a better product. So again, <laughs> so much more research needs to be done. But 
I would like to thank, uh, you know, Nate Controls, Legacy USA, um, Auto Cure, and Hinkleman Vacuum Systems because, you know, none of the science can be done without proper equipment. And so I would love to thank them. And if you would like to see any expanded results from our experiments, um, check out our Instagram or our blog. And I thank you for your time. Awesome. Allison, thank you so much. Terrific presentation. Uh, we do have a number of questions coming in, so I'd like to try and get them all answered. So we're going to get started with them. The first, uh, less related to drying and curing and, and more about lighting. Um, I've heard of operations experiencing substantial drops in yield due to a change to LED lights for vegetative stages and still MH or CMH lights for flower periods. Is this due to the changes in IR, UV, and light penetration? What other factors are there? <laughs> That's funny, I got a light question. Um, so I, I've been doing a lot of light research as well. Um, you know, when I joined Outco, it was told to me that you can't flower under LEDs and, um, you know, it's just not possible. So, of course, I wanted to just give it a try myself and see. And, you know, the thing is with LEDs, I love them. They're, there's a million pros and cons, but at the end of the day, uh, we decided to turn our whole facility over to LEDs. Um, you know, the, the greatest thing about LEDs in my eyes is the ability to get them so close to the plant, uh, you're really able to increase that, that PPFD on the canopy, that instantaneous um, PAR. So, you know, Basically, HPS, you're able to get around 700 micromoles if you're lucky. With these LEDs, you know, different brands of LEDs even, you can get them very close to the canopy because of the heat and get, you know, 1,000 or even 1,200 uh, micromoles. And as you know, cannabis is a very, very high light loving plant, um, so you do get greater yields. I think a lot of the trouble that comes in, you know, when people switch over to LEDs, they'll give it basically one chance, one try. They don't change any of their other techniques or methods, and they do get a, a, a low or a poor, a poor yield. And, you know, they give up and that's it. Whereas if they potentially could have tweaked a few things, you know, they would have got um, really good results. So, um, you know, you've, you've got to consider everything when looking at LEDs, right? Because they're, they're really expensive. Um, they're changing all the time. Most companies have a new LED every six months. But, you know, you just have to weigh out your options uh, for your individual facility and see what works best for you. For us, we couldn't expand horizontally um, to get more canopy space, but we could expand vertically uh, to get more canopy space. And this could only be done with LEDs. Thank you. All right. Uh, that was the only lighting question, I swear. Uh, next <laughs> question, <laughs> what type of HVAC equipment are you using to maintain 60 degrees Fahrenheit and 40 to 60 percent relative humidity in the space since it's difficult to do this with typical refrigerant-based equipment? Yeah, so we have a 11-time carrier unit, um, but we have a, a backup mini split basically in case that one fails. Um, so we are able to get, you know, consistently 60 degrees um, for those first couple of days just to get the water activity low enough. We do have to put excessive amount of dehumidification in, <laughs> but at the same time, three days later, um, we actually turn on a fogger to keep the humidity up enough to where it, it will in turn dry slower. Um, so it is, you know, pretty intense equipment that has to go into it. but um, you know, that, that's where I see the future of cannabis curing and, and drying going is basically having the right equipment to, to do so. Okay. This next question is uh, interesting. It might relate to your discussion of uh, tobacco curing earlier. Uh, do you have any experience with removing chlorophyll for canagar shells? For canagar shells? Um, I'm not sure what that is, to be honest with you. So I think they're talking about um, it's, it's a um, basically a cigar that's sold at the consumer level, and it's uh, instead of a, you know it's got cannabis inside, and then instead of a tobacco leaf, it's got uh, you know cannabis leaves. 
Oh, okay. Um, well, I imagine they're doing the same sort of curing that they're doing with tobacco. Um, I haven't seen it. I'm imagining it to be brown. Um, and if so, you know, that seems like they're probably doing some sort of fermentation smoking practices as, just as they would do in, you know, for tobacco, um, which would be much different than as they would cure and dry the cannabis material that's inside of the, the cigar just because of uh, terpene evaporation and whatnot. Uh -huh. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, how does curing impact the uh, pathogen aspergillus? Aspergillus. Um, well, again, you know, it's all about the water activity. You know, if it's there, it's going to be there and stay there, even if you do have that water activity low enough. Um, so if you think of botrytis, for example, um, just because you do get below that threshold doesn't mean you kill the pathogen. Um, it just means it's not going to continue to grow. And so same thing with aspergillus. Um, you know, certain pathogens like that and like E. coli, those need to be emitted in the first place um, because they're dangerous and because they'll show up in testing no matter what, whereas something not quite as dangerous. I mean, it's not good to breathe, but um, botrytis is it's a bit ubiquitous and it's hard to mitigate completely. Um, so, I, you know, I would advise testing prior to drying and curing for this one and then you know, figuring out where it's coming from. Okay, next question. Uh, what do you think of a day of non-watering before harvest in order to reduce the amount of avail available water to microbes? Yeah, we actually do that as well. Um, our HVAC system and our grow rooms are pretty good in that we can, you know, drop that temperature and humidity pretty well. So we actually cut off watering a couple of days before um, because our, actually our HVAC system is better in our grow rooms than in our dry room. Um, so it just kind of gives you that head start before you actually put it into your dry room. So I would recommend that for sure. Okay, uh, last question for now. Um, how do you measure water activity in flower? Uh, how do you accurately avoid botrytis danger levels without directly measuring inside the bud before going to the cure? Right, so um, again, <laughs> We're, we're at the beginning of everything. Um, there's a couple ways around that. One, we need to be able to correlate water content and water activity, um, which will come in time. But secondly, you know, you could pick one of your really large buds, cut the middle out basically, and take a water activity sample of that. Because the sampling size for measuring water activity is pretty small, and so that would, that would encourage you to pick a smaller bud in which to measure, but in reality, you want to pick one of those dense buds that's, you know, with, between hanging plants um, and looking at that interior to, you know, to truly see what that water activity is. But it, it, at least with my experience, I've noticed, you know, if the outside is 0.65, the inside may be 0.7. So you know, as long as you're getting under that 0.8, you know, you should be fine. And then once it's in the cure, it'll all homogenize back to, you know, a very consistent level throughout the buds. 